This is Windscale Unit 1, a nuclear reactor in the northwest of England. It is also the site of Britain's worst nuclear accident. In 1957, the reactor core began to overheat. Over the following days, the incident at Windscale spiralled out of control, releasing radioactive material across the country, triggering a government cover-up and narrowly avoiding an explosion that threatened to turn the northwest of England into a nuclear wasteland. This is the story of the Windscale accident. It's the morning of October 10th, 1957. 21-year-old plant employee John Harris is travelling into work when he notices something unusual. I used to go in in the morning on the factory bus, as we all did. As you come within about a mile of the, of the plant, you can see those two tall, sort of strange-looking chimneys standing up with a little sort of head on the top. Windscale began construction in 1947 on the northwest coast of England. This is Britain's first atomic factory for the production of plutonium at Windscale in Cumberland, now known to scientists and laymen throughout the world. The atomic age had dawned. Nuclear technology proved to be a powerful source of energy, one that manifested in two distinct forms. The generation of electricity, which could be used to power homes and industries, and the destructive capabilities of atomic weaponry. The facilities at Windscale reflected these dual purposes. There was Calder Hall, a power plant fueled by four Magnox nuclear reactors, which generated electricity for the national grid, and the Windscale piles, two units containing graphite-moderated reactors that were used to produce plutonium and tritium for the British Atomic Bomb Project. It was the chimney of Unit 1 that caught John Harris's attention on the morning of October 10th. The strange thing was somebody said, hey, there's something odd going on, because you could see a very fine drift of sort of pale-coloured smoke just drifting off the top of one of these 400 feet tall chimneys. Harris worked as a researcher at the plant. He understood the inner workings of the reactors and knew that the smoke coming from the chimney of Unit 1 was a sign that something had gone very wrong. Windscale represented an early and relatively simple form of reactor design. The reactor core consisted of a massive block of graphite with hundreds of horizontal channels drilled through it. Fuel cartridges containing a 30 centimeter uranium rod enclosed in a finned aluminium casing could be pushed through the channels. Here they would emit neutrons that would collide with other fuel rods arrayed around the reactor, triggering a chain reaction that released large amounts of heat and altered the atomic structure of the natural uranium, beginning a transmutation from uranium-238 to unstable uranium-235 and later to plutonium. The fuel rods would eventually be pushed out of the back of the reactor core, falling into an adjacent channel of water where they would be collected and processed to extract plutonium. The reactor could be controlled in several ways. The graphite core functioned as a moderator, slowing neutron emission from the uranium to a manageable level. Control rods, made of boron steel, could be inserted from the top of the stack to absorb neutrons, slowing the reactor or shutting it down altogether. Lastly, the reactor was cooled by two auxiliary fans that would blow cool air through the piles and out via a 400-foot chimney. At the top of the chimney were filters, designed to prevent the emission of radioactive particulates into the environment. These were a controversial feature. John Cockcroft, Britain's chief nuclear scientist, had insisted on the costly installation of the filters as a safety measure. His critics argued they were unnecessary, christening them Cockcroft's Follies. Crucially, the chimneys were designed only to ventilate air. At no point would smoke or steam be emitted, except, of course, on the morning of October 10th, 1957. The smoke Harris had observed was the direct result of a fatal flaw within the reactor's design, a flaw that would trigger the impending accident. As in 1957, nuclear technology remains a key global issue. To properly understand these kinds of topics affecting our world, it is important to source unbiased news coverage. That's why I use the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a non-partisan website and app that aggregates news from around the world and across the political spectrum, providing access to every perspective all in one place. Recently, I read this article about North Korea announcing the construction of their first nuclear submarine. Ground News found 160 articles covering the story, providing a more nuanced account than any single news source could. Ground News breaks down the political leaning of each article and provides a biased comparison that identifies opposing viewpoints. For instance, left-wing sources emphasise the enhanced military capabilities of such a submarine, creating a sense of urgency, while right-wing sources are more sceptical, highlighting North Korean resource limitations. Ground News presents a graphic breakdown of this biased distribution, as well as articles' credibility and ownership, offering an invaluable view into the political and financial interests that underpin news coverage. 
One of my favourite features is the blind spot feed, which shows underreported news from both sides of the political spectrum. For instance, if you lean right, you may have missed this story about the discovery of a huge ecosystem beneath an iceberg in the Antarctic, which is being threatened by rising sea temperatures. Ground News shines a light on these hidden stories, giving you access to important information from across the media landscape. Go to ground.news forward slash looped or scan my QR code for 40% off the same vantage plan I use to see the bigger picture. This brings the cost down to $5 a month. For less than the price of a coffee, you can stay informed and support my work. Now, back to the video. Unbeknownst to Windscale's engineers at the time of construction, the reactor was affected by a phenomenon known as Vigna energy. When bombarded by neutrons, the atomic structure of graphite can become dislocated, creating a buildup of potential energy called Vigna energy that is liable to be released in a sudden and unpredictable burst of heat. At Windscale, the large graphite core could build up massive amounts of Vigna energy that threatened to destabilize the reactor. To combat this, operators routinely carried out a controlled heating of the reactor core, providing enough vibrational energy to restructure the graphite atoms, thereby triggering the release of latent Vigna energy in the form of heat. This procedure, referred to as annealing, had been used on eight separate occasions in the plant's history. Each time it had been carried out successfully. At 11.45 a.m. on October 7, 1957, another routine release of Vigna energy was planned in Unit 1. The operators began the annealing process, removing control rods and heating the reactor up to 250 degrees centigrade. By the morning of October 8th, it was clear that the procedure had not worked as intended. The temperature inside the reactor was supposed to rise steadily. Instead, it was starting to cool, a sign that the latent Vigna energy inside was not being released. Operators attempted to repeat the process, restarting the reactor and heating the pile up to 330 degrees. By the following day, this restart appeared to have worked, but now the reactor was heating too quickly, with one specific channel, channel 2053, jumping up to 380 degrees. Operators battled with the reactor, moving control rods in and out in an effort to manage the heat, a process that was likened to trying to steer the Titanic around an iceberg. By 10 p.m. on October the 9th, channel 2053 had reached 412 degrees centigrade. Eventually, the heat sensors melted away entirely, with no way of monitoring the temperature of the reactor, the operators decided to peer within the pile through an inspection hatch. The interior of the reactor, normally the dull grey colour of graphite, had turned a glowing red. Wisps of flame flickered around the edges of the channels. The full magnitude of the situation became apparent. Several cartridges inside the reactor had burst open, and the uranium inside was burning, releasing radioactive particles into the atmosphere. One of those involved, 32-year-old technician Arthur Wilson, later recalled his thoughts at this moment. Oh dear, he remarked, now we really are in a pickle. The difficult task of controlling the fire fell to Windscale's deputy manager, Tom Tui. Tui's first instinct was to turn off the auxiliary fans, which had been employed to cool the temperature of the reactor, but were now fanning the flames inside. With this done, he attempted to create a firebreak around the burning area. Workers used scaffolding poles to try and push out the remaining fuel rods, but this proved nearly impossible. The extreme heat was causing the cartridges to expand and deform lodging them firmly inside the channels. Tui was now faced with a difficult decision. His last resort was to use water to combat the fire. However, this would run the risk of causing an explosion within the reactor. The worry, of course, was if the water produced hydrogen, the whole lot could have gone up. <laughs> and it, at that moment, it wasn't a very pleasant situation. With no other viable options remaining to him, Tui ultimately decided to take the risk and douse the reactor with water. He attempted to mitigate the production of steam by ordering fire crews to feed hoses into the channels furthest away from the fire, allowing the water to slowly seep into the overheated area. This process began at 9am on the morning of October 11th. Tui and his men nervously awaited the results. By midday, no explosion had occurred, and it was clear that the fire was beginning to die. Firefighters kept pouring water into the reactor for the next 30 hours, by which point the fire had been completely extinguished. Britain's worst nuclear accident was finally over, but its consequences were only just beginning. The Windscale disaster was unprecedented. It was Britain's first nuclear accident, but the government was determined to downplay its severity. It was decided that, in order to avoid panic, the local area, including the nearby town of Seascale, should not be evacuated. Instead, limited safety measures were put into place across the surrounding towns. Children were sent home from school, residents were advised to stay inside and keep their windows and doors closed, while workers at the plant were given respirators to wear. 
Other measures involved local dairy farms, which were identified as major vehicles for contamination. Cows would graze on irradiated grass, and this would pass into their milk before being consumed by local people. Samples of milk produced in the area on the 12th of October showed elevated levels of the radioactive isotope iodine-131, and the decision was made to order all dairy farms within two miles of windscale to dispose of their produce, pouring gallons of milk away into local drains and sewers. By Monday, this measure had been extended to an 18-mile area along the coastline, and on October the 15th, as the spread of contamination became better understood, the zone was increased to 200 miles. The farmers were compensated for their loss, with roughly £60,000 paid out by the government to local dairy producers. Outside of the surrounding area, knowledge of the incident at Windscale was limited. The Atomic Energy Authority have announced that some uranium cartridges in the center of the atomic pilot wind scale became overheated yesterday. At the moment, a northeast wind is blowing across the wind scale factory and is taking any radioactive dust or vapor out to sea. Meanwhile, the government, in tandem with the Atomic Energy Authority, were trying to determine exactly what had caused the incident. An inquiry was ordered led by William Penny. Penny was a mathematician with a singular pedigree in nuclear physics. He had worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos during the war and afterwards spearheaded British efforts to acquire atomic weapons. Penny spent 10 days at Windscale interviewing personnel and examining the facility before releasing his findings on October 26th. We have come to the conclusion that the primary cause of the accident was the second nuclear heating, which caused the failure of one or more of the fuel element cans. The exposed uranium oxidized and gave further release of heat, which, together with the rising temperatures occasioned by the later Wigner releases, initiated the fire. Penny's report did not blame the plant operators. The steps taken to deal with the accident were prompt and efficient and displayed considerable devotion to duty. Instead, responsibility for the disaster rested on institutional problems at Windscale. A major technical defect contributing to the accident was the inadequacy of instrumentation for the safe and proper operation of a Wigner release. The absence of an operating manual for Wigner releases must be regarded as a serious defect. Insufficient technical attention has been available to ensure the safe operation of the windscale piles. The British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, read the report on October 29th. Almost immediately, he recalled all copies from government officials and ordered the printers to destroy their type. A government cover-up was now underway. It was being conducted for two reasons. Firstly, Macmillan feared that the publication of Penny's report would ruin public confidence in nuclear power. More importantly, however, it would jeopardize Britain's nuclear relationship with the United States. In the years since the war, the Americans had been reluctant to share atomic secrets with the British. Macmillan had been trying desperately to persuade the Americans to reverse this position. If they learned about the technical embarrassment of Windscale, Macmillan feared that any chance of nuclear collaboration would be out of the window. Macmillan ultimately decided to address the Windscale accident via a parliamentary white paper that contained an amended version of Penny's original report. These amendments presented a different interpretation of the accident. The accident was due partly to faults of judgment by the operating staff, these faults of judgment being themselves attributable to weaknesses of organisation. The blame was being shifted from faulty infrastructure and dangerous processes to operator error. For those who had risked their lives fighting the fire at Windscale, this official condemnation was a kick in the teeth. One physicist described it as absolutely disgraceful, blaming junior people who had no means of defending themselves. Despite some pushback from plant workers, Macmillan's white paper successfully hushed up the major technical problems that had existed at Windscale. On November 8, 1957, a month after the accident, the British tested their first hydrogen bomb in the Indian Ocean. It was constructed from plutonium and tritium produced in the Windscale reactors. The following year, the US-UK Mutual Defence Agreement was signed, which promised cooperation on the uses of atomic energy between the two countries. From Macmillan's perspective, the entire operation had been a success, but this did not alter the reality of Windscale's radioactive fallout. It was estimated that 12 kilos of uranium had been released from the chimney of Unit 1 during the accident. These emissions included large amounts of radioactive isotopes like xenon-135, iodine-131 and cesium-137. Despite assertions at the time that northeasterly winds had blown this material harmlessly out to sea, the truth was more complicated. The wind had indeed been moving towards the Irish Sea between the 10th and 12th of October, but its direction was reversed at higher altitudes, pushing radioactive particles back across large parts of the English coast. Even the material that did follow a northeasterly path did not disappear altogether. Instead, it moved across the Irish Sea, passing over the Isle of Man and onto Ireland. 
the windscale accident had very real health consequences. These were most pronounced in plant workers. 14 operators had been exposed to levels of radiation that exceeded the annual permissible dosage. Some, like Arthur Wilson, the man who peered into the viewing hatch of the reactor, were permanently disabled by the dosage they received. Others, like Deputy Manager Tom Tui, who lived into his 90s, maintained that they had never been affected by their exposure to radiation. The wider impact of windscale on public health is complex and difficult to gauge. A report published in 1960 concluded that the effects would be negligible. However, later reappraisals began to grasp the true long-term extent of the accident. A 1988 study estimated an upper limit of 200 cancer cases linked to emissions from windscale. Similar effects have been detected outside of the UK. In the Irish city of Dundalk in County Louth, one study reported a 12% increase in cancer rates connected to the event. In 2007, on the 50th anniversary of the accident, a report published by the Society for Radiological Protection attributed 250 cases of cancer to radioactive emissions from windscale, with roughly 100 of these estimated to have been fatal. Despite the medical evidence, the British government has not adopted a program of financial compensation for those affected by the accident. Although the consequences of the windscale fire are undeniable, the accident could have been far worse. Cockcroft's Follies, the name given to the filters installed on the top of the windscale chimneys, blocked roughly 90% of radioactive material from being released into the environment. Without these, emissions would have been an order of magnitude higher, spreading wider contamination and likely triggering the evacuation of the entire local area. Another, more dangerous scenario would have been an explosion at the site. If this had occurred, as Tom Tui and his colleagues feared during the dousing of the reactor, the accident at Windscale would have transformed into a major disaster, almost certainly killing workers inside the facility and contaminating a much larger area of the northeast. Fortunately, through the bravery and quick thinking of workers at Windscale, as well as the far-sighted safety measures lobbied for by John Cockcroft, a more serious disaster was averted. The effects of the Windscale accident have since been dwarfed by later nuclear disasters. Chernobyl, for instance, is estimated to have released roughly 2,000 times more iodine-131, while the Fukushima disaster released nearly 1,500 times more xenon-133. Like Chernobyl and Fukushima, Windscale has been subject to a lengthy and expensive clean-up operation. Both reactors were shut down following the accident. The site was renamed Sellafield in 1981 as part of a reorganisation. Since then, contaminated material, fuel cartridges and pieces of machinery have been collected and vitrified in concrete a process that was not completed until 1999. The chimney above Unit 2 was demolished in 2001. Due to the presence of nuclear materials around Unit 1, its chimney cannot be brought down using normal demolition techniques. Instead, the structure is being painstakingly deconstructed brick by brick. As of 2025, the majority of Unit 1's chimney remains standing, looming over the surrounding area as a stark reminder of the dangerous potential of nuclear energy or, as one of Windscale's original designers has described it, a monument to our ignorance.